But before we get started, I would like to just take a moment just to kind of like tune in. So if you can just find a comfortable seated position and just kind of close your eyes just for a brief moment. And as you're sitting in here in this moment to begin to listen to the sound of your breath. As you inhale, feel the breath moving in through the nose to the back of the throat and then down into the lungs. The Yoga Sutras say that when the mind is reunited with the breath, mind immediately becomes at peace with itself as it's reunited with its old long lost friend. And so our practice is to reestablish the mind's connection between the two gatekeepers of life inhalation and exhalation. As you inhale, feel the breath now moving even deeper into the body, into the navel center maybe, and then perhaps down into the pelvic region. If your mind wanders to sounds or to feelings or to thoughts, just gently guide the mind back to watching the breath. Guide your mind back to this moment. Guide your mind back to the present. Namaste. Wonderful. Thank you guys so much for joining this webinar today. I'm just very excited to be offering these. Um, we actually had a large amount of people signing up, so I'm sure that they're going to get it on the replay. We do post these. Um, so that they're available in the replay. One of the advantages to joining in live is that you can actually ask questions. And this is one of my offerings that I'm giving right now is giving people, my students or potential students or people just interested in being on this journey to just have a direct conversation with me. Uh, each month we're posting a different topic and, um, and we're gonna be, I'm committing to do this until the end of the year. And we're also kind of posting these as a follow-up to the podcast. So each topic that we're choosing to kind of discuss about and then meander into a Q&A is basically following the podcast. Before I kind of dive into this, I'm just curious, have you guys been listening to the podcast? Have you heard it? Um, did you know that there was a podcast? <laughs> I'm just kind of curious. Does anybody want to jump in and just kind of add anything? Nope. Okay. <laughs> well, we'll just dive into the topic then. If you haven't heard the podcast yet, um, I will put it in, we'll send an email out about it. It's called Stop Stretching. And it's actually part of the conversation today, uh, that very idea. So the last podcast, episode number four, is titled, What is a Yama? 
And so this is kind of what Ayama is really what led me into this whole journey. So today we're going to cover my personal story with pain and how I uh, helped to heal myself and heal my pain. Um, then we're going to talk a little bit about how I use that to find my dharma. And one of the things that I want to give you guys today is the top three practices for healing pain from an Ayama perspective. So having said that, let me just dive into my personal story. Um, as many of you know, I go by Yogi Aaron, which means that I've been practicing yoga for quite a while. And um, I can tell you that the very first time I injured myself, I was 18 years old. I'll never forget, I was working in kind of like the shipping wholesale center, and I was moving a bunch of boxes around, and my lower back just completely went out. And I... I was like, what the heck is going on? I'm too young to be having my back going out at this moment. <laughs> so part of my journey actually took me to yoga. And one of the reasons why I turned to yoga is because I kept looking around me and I kept seeing these older people that looked old, not just like we're older, but actually looked old and it's kind of funny I joke with with some of my friends now because I think that when I was 18 like older was like 50 years old right well I'd actually just turned 50 so <laughs> I guess I'm one of those older people now <laughs> so so I was like noticing that older people who looked old really kind of didn't have a lot of movement in their body they, they looked stuck and and then I saw older people that kind of looked young and they had a lot of movement and they were vivacious and, and just kind of out there living their best life and kind of like sort of wondered, like, maybe I need to start stretching more. Maybe stretching was that key. And, and then that's what really led me to yoga. Before I kind of go on with the story, I want to just kind of like put it out there that I've been interviewing a lot of people a lot of people. And one of the things that I keep hearing from not just a couple of people, but pretty much across the board, is that a lot of people really believe that stretching equals health, stretching equals youthfulness, stretching equals vitality. And when you watch people that have a lot of mobility, you kind of think like, oh, maybe I just need to be more loose. Maybe I need to be more open. So let's put a pin in that. I started doing uh, yoga practice at a very young age. And by the time I was 25, I was dealing, even before 25, I was dealing with chronic lower back pain. Um, it's constantly like stretching to feel good. And some days it would feel good and, and then other days it wouldn't. And then I started noticing if I started doing activities like standing on my feet all day long, my back would be sore the next day and maybe even for a few days. And this kind of like went on and on and on. I started getting more and more into yoga. And it was always interesting to me because I always felt good after the yoga practice. Always, like just it would feel like alive and my blood would be flowing and I would feel loosey-goosey. <laughs> and, then, and then I would go uh, wake up the next morning and right, my lower back would just start killing me. And I would think like, okay, I have to start stretching out these hips, you know, open my hips. And so I kept endeavoring to open my hips for many, many, many years after that. Kind of flash forward to um, when I was around 31, I started developing this really bad searing neck pain. So not only did I was dealing with, with back pain, but now I was dealing with neck pain that was kind of coming from uh, my shoulders, or at least I thought it was coming from my shoulders. And what was the solution to that? It was stretching. I was constantly like doing these practices and holding my head here for five minutes at a time and then doing the other side. And then sometimes I would use my hand to try and stretch it out. And I always felt better always but then again like the next day or the day after the pain would come back and usually with a vengeance in 2005 I remember I really threw my neck out bad and 
and I thought, okay, well, I'll just do what I was doing. I'll just stretch it out. And it actually didn't get better. I remember I was one of my very first retreats to Costa Rica and I was here and I was leading the retreat and I can't tell you how much pain I was in just in my neck and it was so bad I couldn't sleep. I was actually suffering from severe sleep deprivation trying to lead this yoga retreat. So I ended up going back to New York and that was where I met my, I call him my guy, <laughs> but he's kind of like a jack of all trades. He's my healer, Eric, Dr. Eric Steibel. Um, he's actually, he's got so many certificates behind him. He's got his chiropractic license uh, now, which is one of them. He's done all levels of rolfing. But the thing that he actually did with me that created the most impact uh, during that session was a thing called muscle activation. And he had studied with Greg Roscoff from uh, the MAT school, uh, muscle activation technique. And I had been to a lot of massage therapists. I've studied a lot of yoga, <laughs> a lot of yoga, a lot of yoga, um, different techniques. And, and it was really this technique of muscle activation that really became the game changer. And over that, well, one of the most interesting things about Eric was that after I had seen so many massage therapists, nobody could reduce the pain. Yeah, sure, it would feel good in the moment, but nothing ever really kind of stuck. And, and then when Eric worked on me, one of the things that he said was, yeah, what I'm trying to do is to turn on the muscles in your neck. Your neck is kind of stuck in one position and, and it's stuck there because the muscles that should be holding your neck in the correct position are not doing their job, really. And the funny thing was about Eric was that he brought my pain level from like a nine out of 10. I mean, that moment when I saw him, I was literally in tears because I was suffering so much from uh, nerve pain that he actually brought my pain like from a nine out of 10 down to like a one, one, two out of 10, which is really remarkable. And and then I just started getting, you know, better after that. I saw him a few more treatments and then I didn't see him for a long time. Silly me, I should have kept up with it. But eventually over the years, I started to develop more and more of a relationship with Eric. And as we developed our relationship together, he introduced me more and more to muscle activation technique. And this muscle activation uh, technique, it wasn't something that I did all myself. He would do it to me. But it started to make me really kind of think about muscles in a different way. He started working on some of the different issues in my body that I was dealing with, primarily with my back and my glutes, um, constant sciatic pain, uh, constant shoulder pain, things that I call them yoga injuries, but I actually really call them yoga ego related injuries, you know, too much chaturangas <laughs> and, and doing some crazy stuff. And <clears throat> over the time, I just, and from learning from him, I started taking little things and implementing them in my yoga classes over the years. And I started to see like a huge difference with my students. My students, every time I kind of did these practices, they always were stronger. They always had less pain in their body. And like, I was starting to really think like, maybe I need to stop stretching so much and start activating more. I'll be honest with you. One of the things that I came to realize, especially when I was doing the podcast series and write, writing the script for it, is that there was a certain point when I was thinking to myself, I really should stop stretching and teach, I should stop teaching stretching and just teach activation. And there was a moment when I thought, if I don't teach stretching, then what am I gonna teach? <laughs> you know, I'm a yoga teacher. Yoga teachers should be teaching stretching. And it's kind of a funny oxymoron because if you talk to any teachers, one of the things that yoga teachers will often say is, yoga has absolutely nothing to do with stretching. Well, but then what are we doing if we're not teaching stretching? And that was kind of like my conundrum. Like, it's like, what am I gonna do? So I um, everything kind of culminated right in 2018. And 
you know, I kind of would have problems and then they would go away and I would have problems and they would go away. And around in 2018, I remember I went on this trip uh, for my birthday and my, I started having this enormous pain in my back, you know, it's like, happy birthday to me. <laughs> Great birthday present. Um, and, but when I came back from that trip, I had actually decided to start doing this practice, which involved a lot of forward folds, a lot of long holds. And I don't know really why I decided to start doing it looking back. I think I just wanted to really kind of invest myself into a, a specific kind of practice. But those were the worst two ingredients for me because what actually happened was the pain that I experienced on my birthday trip it started to snowball and actually exacerbate and become much worse. It actually got so worse that I ended up in the hospital. Um, pre preceding getting into the hospital, every time I would do my practice, I would like be kind of limping over to my yoga mat <laughs> and I would get down and I would do these, do this practice, and I would be great. I would feel better afterwards. But literally about an hour to an hour and a half, somewhere in that time frame, um, the pain would come back and it actually started to snowball and become worse. I remember too, I had a, a friend come and visit me who was a massage therapist. And he had like these kind of, um, you know, these balls that people kind of roll on. And he was like, Aaron, we got to roll on that psoas. And he had me rolling on my psoas. He had me rolling on my glutes. He had me rolling everywhere in my body. And I would be like, yeah, it feels better. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then sure enough, the pain would actually start to uh, come back. What I didn't realize at the time, two things. One, that by stretching, I was actually shutting down the muscles. So some of the practices I was doing, I would do a little bit of muscle activation, but I always ended with like five minute pigeon pose or some of these like hip openers and some of these forward folds. So I would be doing, I would get my glutes a little stronger and then I would go and hold pigeon for five minutes, which would actually completely shut down the glutes. And so I would end up leaving my practice with more instability in my body. And the second thing that kind of like made that situation worse and why I ended up in the hospital was because of my lower back, <laughs> I kind of wonder now how long it, you know, if I traced it back, like did this start actually happening when I was 18, 20, 25, but I have a slight herniation. And as I was doing all those forward folds, the disc was actually pressing more and more into the pain receptors of my spine. And this kind of just like I said, made it worse and worse and worse. And what started to happen was an inflammatory process. I remember when I first made the appointment and I ended up in the doctor's office, he looked at me and he said, you know what? And he showed me the x-ray of my spine. He said, we're gonna need to do surgery on you, I think. This is not a good, healthy spine. And I can't tell you what that did to me and and how that kind of like landed in my space i think of myself as at that moment i was almost teaching for 30 years i know a lot about the human body or at least i thought i knew a lot about the human body i thought i understood proper alignment you know so many people say well maybe you weren't aligned but oh no i i'm i'm very particular about my physical alignment i pay very clear attention to everything in my body. So when he said to me, like, your spine is damaged, it really, really kind of hit home, like some things needed to change. Maybe I didn't, maybe what I was doing really wasn't working and I needed to adjust my whole paradigm. So I actually went back to um, Blue Osa and I was leading a teacher training and thank God one of my friends was helping me during that teacher training because the pain got so bad. I had to go back to San Jose and go into the hospital and get this like injection in my spine to get rid of the inflammation. Um, sometimes the, the cure is worse than, than the pain because it actually 
once the numbing wore off from that experience, I was in pain for about another week. Um, but it slowly started to get better. And as it got better, I went back and visited Eric. And that was probably the single most important turning point for me because I really got clear with him in how much these practices are really starting to cause more instability in the body. I actually think about one of my really good friends um, who I, whose name I won't mention here, but he's also a very, um, he's also a yoga teacher and he was kind of dealing with something that I was dealing with. He had a herniated disc. He was also dealing with some other issues in his lower back. But I said to him, you know, I think we need to focus more on activation. And um, at that time, he was 50 years old. And I'll never forget when he walked into Blue Osa and he was kind of like hunched over like an old man and kind of like, you know, guarding his lower back because he could not stand up in extension. He didn't have the muscular strength to actually stand up. And, and I gave him some suggestions. And one of them was obviously stop stretching. And he just wouldn't listen to me. And a year later, he ended up in the hospital getting a spinal fusion. So one of the things that was interesting, though, is when, I, when he let me work on him and when I got the muscles working properly, he was actually able to stand up completely erect and pain-free. So this stuff works and, and as if we use it, it works. And I can tell you since my, since that date in 2018, I haven't had any more back problems. And I really attribute that to all of these practices that I'm doing. It's very clear to me that we need to be practicing or utilizing things in our daily lives that actually improves muscle function, not depletes it. And that's what has really kind of led me to this more of an Ayama approach, this applied yoga anatomy and muscle activation uh, approach to the way that I teach yoga, um, but also the way or, or the messaging that I want to get out there. I really believe that we don't need to take a lot of time to, to spend on ourselves. Like, like we don't need to go to the gym for an hour and a half or two hours a day. We don't need to do a lot of things that people say that we should do. What we do need to do is take a little, carve a little bit of time in our day to spend in our body and, and start our days, if you will, completely activated. Um, and, and as we start activating our muscles more, a couple of things happen, but one is like, we're able to start dealing with the, the, the stress that life kind of throws at us. <laughs> you know, life throws us a lot of stress. Um, just sitting at your desk, typing on your computer all day, that's a stress that life is throwing at you. Uh, some of you deal with kids. Some of you have to drive, you know, long distances. Um, all of these things are just different stresses. And when we start to apply just very simple exercises into our daily life. Um, and I always say the magic number for me is somewhere around eight minutes, eight, minim eight minutes minimum. If you don't have to do the same thing every day, you can mix it up. But just if we can give eight minutes of, of time to our body, we're just gonna feel so much better. Um, so this kind of ties in with sort of the, the theme is how this kind of led me to unraveling more of my life purpose. That is a huge topic, but there's a few things that I really wanna say about it. Number one, so many people are asking this question, how do I find my purpose? And if we kind of like just stop for a moment and look at all the different places our attention goes, you know, our mind is going to our job, our mind is going to our relationships, our mind is going to our children, our mind is going to our diet. Like, what am I going to eat tonight? <laughs> what am I going to make for dinner? Did I get enough sleep? Am I going to get enough sleep? Like our mind is constantly going outwards to all of these like little problems. And I would actually opine or say, or suggest that one of the biggest areas 
that our mind is going to in our life is our own pain management, whether it's internal or external. The domain that I'm kind of referring to right now is the external pain, the pain in your back, the pain in your knees, the pain in your shoulders. I'll never forget when I was about, I was a, about the age of 29, 30 years old, and I love to hike and I love to be in the outdoors. And I used to live in Vancouver, Canada, and there's this beautiful hike there. Oh my God. It's just, it's British Columbia is one of the most amazing places in the world. Uh, and Vancouver is like even more precious, but it was on this amazing hike up the Indian arm and it was called Nueve Vistas, meaning like nine points. And, and I went on that hike and at the end, it was a lot of down and my knees really gave out. I couldn't walk for three days after that hike. And I was 29, like 29, 30 years old. That's not okay. <laughs> that shouldn't be happening. You know, um, my teacher, Greg Roscoff, always says that age in the body, like muscular deterioration happens as a result of muscles not activating properly. And if we can get the muscular system activating properly, then really we can start to kick age in the butt and we don't have to uh, slow down in life. We don't have to stop. We don't have to stop doing the things that we love and, and really that kind of fulfill us at a deep human you know, level. And what I would say with this connection to life purpose that one of the very biggest tenets of a yama is let's get our mind off of pain. How do we do that? We start living a more pain-free life. So that way we're not managing our pain incessantly. If your mind is going here and there and here and there, you know, let's manage it. Let's take care of it. One of the things about pain is that it's like the check engine light. It's talking to, I'm leading a yoga teacher training right now. And one of the things that I was kind of noticing with a lot of the people there is they can't stand up for very long. And I was just saying to them, you know, why are you sitting down? Are you in pain? And it's not bad to sit down. It's not like, okay, I'm a bad person for sitting down. That's not the point. The point is, is that there is like, there's pain from standing and it's not that the standing is bad. It's like the pain is trying to tell you that there's muscles that are not working properly. There's pain is telling you that there's something that's going on and we need to get underneath the hood <laughs> of this vehicle and start finding out what is causing that pain and how do I start to take care of it? Let's pay attention to our pain. A lot of times in the yoga world, and this is a very kind of perverted, um, silly, uh, you, not a useful idea is that we need to work through the pain. You know, we need to get through the pain, but that pain is actually there telling you something is not right. And we need to pay attention to it or something bigger is going to happen. Like a bigger problem is going to happen. When I was in Greece last summer, <laughs> I was in Athens. And one of the things about that trip was I had no plans. I had absolutely no plans at all. Um, and so I was so excited because I was in Athens for four days. I landed in Athens. I was there for four days and I got a car and I was like, I don't know where I'm going to go, but I'm just going to drive. Well, one hour, literally, I'm not kidding. One hour after leaving Athens, the check engine light came on <laughs> and I was like, oh lord so i called the car rental place i had them on whatsapp and i got the car rental place on there and i said hey the check engine lights come on i'm like i don't think this is a good sign he goes i don't worry about it just keep driving and it'll be fine don't worry about it well guess what happened uh, literally an hour later the car would not start and I was stuck, <laughs> which was great that I had no plans because I ended up exactly where I should be, maybe. <laughs> but, <clears throat> but the point is that we have to pay attention to the check engine light because if we don't, you know, problems are going to happen. And we see this a lot. When I went to um, on my birthday trip and I ended up with that pain, 
I just kept stretching it out and just saying, okay, the practice, the yoga practice is going to work it out, but it didn't work it out. The pain started exacerbating, exacerbating, exacerbating. And um, I tried to find modifications. A modification is just another word for compensation. You know, we start to compensate with our pain. We have pain when we, when we go to bed at night and we put a pillow in between our legs because we don't want to be in pain. So we find ways in our life to compensate. We are good at compensating. You know, the animal kingdom, which we are a part of the animal kingdom, we are really good at finding ways to get from point A to point B in life, no matter what is going on, we will crawl there, we will claw our way there, but we will get there in some way, shape or form. Um, and, and so part of this pain is there to teach us a lesson, um, teach us something about our body, what is actually going on, and inviting us to give us the opportunity to go underneath the hood and take a look and start addressing it head on. So that's a little bit about what I wanted to say about purpose. Um, and the other thing I wanted to say about purpose is that the, one of the keys for me to unlock purpose and to kind of just check in, am I really living my purpose right now, is getting still. And so at the beginning of this webinar, it's one of the reasons why I wanted to do a little bit of a check-in. I wanted us to come back to that stillness, come back to that present moment, to come back to just having the mind be in the moment. As I mentioned earlier, our mind is constantly going outward, thinking about what we're going to have for dinner, thinking about our job. Um, some of us can't sleep at night because we're constantly thinking about what we have to do at work the next day. Some of us wake up in a panic, you know, from a deep sleep because we're thinking about what we have to finish in the job. So we're constantly going outwards in our life. And one of the keys to unlocking purpose is just to get still. And how that it relates to an Ayama perspective from an applied yoga anatomy and muscle activation perspective, which is a perfect combination with any kind of yoga practice, is that if our mind is constantly like thinking about the pain and how to get rid of pain, we're never going to get still. You know, that time when I told you about when I went to the hospital, ended up in the emergency room. And part of that process, part of that, what had happened there, I mean, I couldn't think of anything else. I couldn't be living my best life at that moment. I couldn't sit with like, where am I supposed to be going from here? All I could think about was how to get out of pain, how to become pain-free. That was the only thing that I could think about. Part of our work, I believe as humans, is to go out and fulfill life's purpose, to fulfill the purpose of our heart, to fulfill the purpose of life. And if you want to put God behind that statement, you can do that. Um, and to really fulfill the purpose of our soul. And how do you do that? Like, what is that about? <laughs> Part of the secret to unlocking that um, is to get still. And Getting still requires us to be pain-free in our body, to cultivate a sense of stability. Stability is so important. Um, and that's a huge conversation to kind of unpack. But if you kind of look at your life and, and ask yourself, like, where is there instability? The truth is that a lot of us have already a lot of stability, but we go out of our ways to create more instability. So that's, I mean, that's, that's where the work comes at a very individual level. How can I just cultivate that feeling of stability with myself so that I can start to create more opportunities for stillness and inward reflection? Um, the third thing uh, that we're going to talk about today is um, sort of three practices for healing pain. And I wanted to just kind of talk a little bit about this. Um, these are kind of three practices that I talk about in episode four of Ayama. Um, right at the top of the list <laughs> is, a very, is actually an Ayama principle, which I've mentioned already a few times. Stop 
stretching. <laughs> Yogi, stop stretching. Um, <laughs> seriously, <laughs> um, we have to stop stretching. If you're if you're in a deep stretching program and you're experiencing pain, just know that the stretching is going to make it worse. Why that is? There's a great webinar that I did um, uh, called uh, "How Flexibility and Stretching Is Hurting You." Um, we're actually sending out an email about it tomorrow. I think it's tomorrow or the next day. So you're going to get it. And I would encourage you to watch it if you haven't already. But the short answer, the very, very, very short answer is that when we stretch, what happens is that the brain loses connection at a neuromuscular level, at a neuromuscular level with that, with that muscle. So the brain gets disconnected from that muscle and it takes that muscle sort of been documented anywhere from 30 minutes to many days <laughs> to reestablish that connection. So if you're kind of like going out to the uh, mall with your friends and you're gonna go shopping all day and you start walking around and it's about maybe 45 minutes or an hour later and your back starts hurting, that's a very good sign that there's a lot of muscles in your body that aren't working. The absolute wrong thing to do from an Ayama perspective is to actually try and go stretch those muscles. You might feel better, but you actually have now even more than ever disconnected the brain from any kind of muscles that would be creating more stability for you. So that's definitely at the top of the list. Um, but the second point is, if you are in a yoga class and you are kind of doing these kind of stretchy kind of classes, my suggestion to create more stability is only go to 30% of what you think you should do or can do. Only 30%. Yoga, and, and again, this is like, I believe one of the words that is not discussed enough in the yoga world is that really the key that key to unlock the most sublime, auspicious practices and most reverent practices of yoga, and I'm actually talking about asana right now, is getting still, is stability, is being able to feel more in your body and, and, and connecting the breath to the movement, connecting the breath to the body, and you might think like, yeah, Yogi Aaron, I've done that before. I've gone to class and my teacher says, breathe and I breathe. <laughs> that kind of breathing is great. It's fantastic. I'm so happy you're doing it. But it will never, that kind of breathing is a starting place, but it is not the place that you want to end up in if you want to start penetrating the veil. Um, the veil into the most auspicious and sublime practices of yoga. If you really want to start to understand the potency of what yoga can be for us in our life, we have to start getting stable. And part of that stability, part of that key to unlocking that stability is becoming effortless. I, sometimes I call it effortless effort. <laughs> I mean, there is some effort that you need to cultivate to become still. And that stems from stability. Um, but it's also effortless. It should not be effortful. You shouldn't be going to yoga going, maybe if you're a beginner and the breath is new for you, sure. I mean, breathing is sometimes a new concept for many people. And I'm not, you know, trying to be uh, glib in saying that it really is. I'm always surprised at people when they come into teacher training the first time, how they really struggle with diaphragmatic breathing. It's really amazing to me, but I've been doing this a long time and we all have to start somewhere. But as we grow into this practice of yoga, part of the practice is to becoming effortless, is to try less and feel more. So that's the second point that I want to impart um, and key to start unlocking uh, these pain-free practices is try less, feel more, only go to 30% of what you think your capacity is. And the third thing that I'm gonna offer to you today 
is to start practicing this pose. And I talk about this in the fourth episode, a pose called Shalabhasana or sometimes Superman pose. If I had to pick one pose that you should do every single day, no matter what is happening in your life, it'll only take you three minutes and three minutes can change the course of your life. So stop stretching, practice becoming effortless and only go to 30% of what you think you can do in your yoga class. And the third thing is do Shalabhasana. Now I said only go to 30%. Shalabhasana is something you should give like 150%. I want you going for it. <laughs> and so Shalabhasana, Superman pose is a pose where you lie on your stomach and you just simply lift your legs, keep your legs as straight as possible and lift your chest simultaneously. And you're going to start doing two things. One, you're going to engage the glutes. So remember I talked about that back pain when you're out there doing these long walks, you're going and doing this, you're getting back pain because your glutes are not working properly. We need to get those glutes working better. And why do the glutes shut down so much? Well, there's a lot out there about why they might shut down from, you know, if you do a lot of yoga asana and you're opening your hips, well, all of these hip openers are overstretching the glutes in horrible way. Um, and when you're stretching the glutes, the glutes will shut down. So we want to keep the glutes engaged as much as possible. We need to get those glutes firing up. This one of the other second things um, that you can actually, I'm demonstrating it perfectly right now, <laughs> is sitting. Sitting, you know, for 30 minutes. Um, my Eric once told me that when we sit for 30 minutes, the glutes actually start to shut down and start atrophying. You know, the old adage about if you have a desk job of going to the water cooler every 25, 28 minutes, there's a lot of wisdom in that, you know, because you stand up, you're squeezing your glutes, you're stretching your body. Well, I shouldn't have said stretch, opening your chest. <laughs> I had to catch myself there, Sherry, um, that you're straight, you're opening up your body, you're engaging your back muscles. And you walk over to the water cooler and your glutes start to turn on. So there's a lot of wisdom, uh, inherent wisdom in that idea of like, I'm going to go to the water cooler and it's that time. And it just kind of invigorates your body. So it's a really great idea. But Shalabhasana, first and foremost, it engages your glutes. And then second of all, it engages all the lower back muscles. If you do this pose, you lie on your stomach. Not now, but when you get a moment, maybe after you get off this video, go and lie down and lift your legs and lift your chest up and take your hands and feel the back muscles. And you're going to feel all those back muscles really engage and fire up. Um, it's just, it's, it's just great. And it's so important to get those, those spinal extensor muscles activated. Um, because they are the ones that are supporting the spine, which ultimately supports the vertebrae joints and keeps all the discs and all everything where it's supposed to be. So those are my three things. When you're practicing Sholabhasana, remember to hold it for six seconds. So when you count and you're holding it for six seconds, you count one, 1,000, two, 1,000, three, 1,000, four, 1,000, five, 1,000, six, 1,000. Oh my God, that was a long six seconds. <laughs> and you do that and you come back down and you come back up and you do it six times. So you do that practice six times. Do that every single day, no matter what. If you're a walker, do Shalabhasana. If you're a hiker, do Shalabhasana. If you're going to the grocery store to go grocery shopping, do Shalabhasana. <laughs> if you're doing gardening, do Shalabhasana. I cannot tell you, just by doing some simple um, muscle activation techniques, how much it really will start to A, prepare your body in a very profound way, but also to prevent injuries. Because I want you guys to be able to do these things like hiking or running or just hanging out at the mall with your friends and really not being so consumed in your mind with pain or feeling tired or feeling kind of like achy in your body. I want you guys to just 
feel really, really strong. So that kind of ties up the talk. Um, I want to open it up for some uh, questions. And I just wanted to see if anybody had a question. I have a few questions here. Um, I think what I'll do is I'll just start with these questions and then you guys can just jump in and ask any questions. So one of the things that comes up a lot is how do I know what my life purpose is? How do I find it? Well, this is a really interesting question and, and I could just hear some of you even thinking that when I was talking about it, like I'm just struggling to find my life purpose. Part of it, as I mentioned earlier, is just getting still and removing the obstacles in your way. And one of those obstacles, Patanjali actually mentions this quite a bit, is to make sure that we're not dealing with physical pain. So getting our body stronger. Um, and there's a few different ways that we do that. I hope that with these Ayama-based practices that you can start doing that. Um, if you're not already enrolled in the 15 day program, I highly recommend it um, and just start going through those different practices every day. But one of the things that I kind of wanted to say is that so many of us are living in this hamster wheel of, called life. You know, we're, we're just constantly like running, 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 running to work, running to get home, running to get to the gym, running to get to yoga classes, <laughs> running to meet up with our family and, you know, running, running, running. And how can we find purpose in that perpetual movement? Sometimes if we're in a car driving one way and the car's not stopping, we have to get out of the car and we have to just stop and just breathe and get still. And so one of the things that I kind of wanted to just kind of put out there is to invite you, if you're feeling like you're in that hamster wheel, to kind of like take that pause in your life. And sometimes that pause might be a vacation, although a vacation is usually filled with other distractions. So unless you go on vacation with that real intention of like, I'm going to create stillness, I'm not going to do anything, I'm not going to have any plans, that can really work. Another thing that you can consider is looking for like a retreat, going on a yoga retreat or going on some sort of yoga immersion. And I can't tell you how many times that people come on my yoga teacher training immersions and literally within the first five days, like the answers that they were looking for just drop in. And the reason for that is because they're not in the hamster wheel of their life and they're in a place that really supports stillness. Uh, one of the questions that also came up today um, is if someone is overweight, would it be better to do the movement as much as they could or modify it? Some moves are difficult, even child's pose. So um, the person that wrote this, I don't know who wrote this, it came in on the, on the anonymous Q&A. But first of all, we don't teach child's pose in a yama. <laughs> it's the number one pose that we tell people not to do. Um, and then the second thing is, it really depends. Um, if I'm working with somebody who's in chronic pain, um, we sometimes we have to find ways to modify the poses. Um, but if you are a person that's overweight, what I have observed, and I've seen this firsthand in my teacher trainings, like the, especially the 28 day one. I had a gentleman come in last year um, in the 28 day one. And I wouldn't say that he was overweight, but he definitely needed to lose some weight. And, but it was just shocking. I remember looking at him right at the beginning of week four. And I said to him, you know, you, your body is transformed. And he was like, yeah, my body has transformed. And a big part of that was that he was starting to activate his muscles. There's an interesting thing that starts to happen psychologically. When we do these muscle activation practices, when we do this muscle activation poses, one of the things that happens is we start to feel stable. Once we start to feel stable, we innately feel stronger. And as we feel stronger, we feel more confident. So get out, move your body. <laughs> and I would say no matter how big or how small or whatever shape your body is in, just start doing the practices the best that you can. Obviously, we don't want to push it. We're not looking to push ourselves in any pose. Less is more. 
but at the same time, we do want to start to create some of that muscle activation. I think some questions just came in here. So let's just take a quick look. I have to get my glasses out. So um, yes, no questions here, but just some comments. Thank you, Sherry. Yes. <laughs> um, what will I be teaching and who will come to my class? I don't know if there was a question, but if you wanna just kind of jump in and ask the question, uh, Sherry, feel free to, to do that. Do you guys have any other questions here? You guys wanna just kind of pop in and ask the question? Well, I have another question that kind of came up in the um, in the in the survey, and one of them was, um, if you are in so much pain, what do you do? And I'm talking like at the point where I was at. You know, I've been very blessed um, in my life to have attracted a few healers. One of them is Eric, and I went and spent time with Eric um, because I was in so much pain. I needed to get answers. So what I would suggest is that if you're in that much pain, I have two suggestions. One is to go and get help, go and get help, whether it's from our Yama community um, to find a, a Yama yoga teacher that is in your area, uh, somebody that you can work with. Um, I know that Sherry's here on the call. She's in, I think, Montreal. So you can always, if you're in the Montreal area. <laughs> but the other thing I just wanted to kind of put out was, um, put out there was to also practice spinal molding. We're actually going to be putting out a few videos on spinal molding. It's one of my favorite techniques. If you don't know what spinal molding is, in the meantime, you can um, look at it. I have a, a blog post um, and I'm happy to send it to you. So if you email me, I can send you the blog post um, or you can go to blueosa.com forward slash blog. And it's actually right at one of the ones that's right at the top. It's a practice for the neck. And in that practice, I actually give uh, spinal molding. So I kind of talked about it um, there. Spinal molding is just a fantastic way to get started. Um, it's a very gentle practice to start aligning the curves of the body. And it's like I said, it's just a simple place to start. Um, if you can roll over onto your stomach and start to practice Sholabhasana. If you can just kind of get in to start, even if you lift like half an inch, like even if you're lifting your chest and your legs that much off of the ground, it's going to start engaging the muscles and in the back and in the glutes. And that will have sort of um, an effect that will start to build you up, okay? So even if you're in excruciating pain, do try and do some of these Ayama-based practices. It will make a difference and it will slowly start the cycle or reverse the cycle that's downward and start to change the cycle and start to spiral upwards. Sherry, you're back. Do you want to ask your question? Back. Yeah, so so to your point um, about Salabasana, like when I first started, I barely lifted off the ground. Mm -hmm. And so just working on it um, consistently, you'll see that extension does increase. And then it's crazy also how much it impacts your flexibility or your range of motion. Um, but my question, uh, Yogi Aaron, was about um, this concept that sometimes we think it's too late, right? So for many, many years, we've been practicing a certain way or we're at a certain age but you mentioned earlier that you interviewed a lot of people. And so from those that you interviewed, what have you noticed around that limiting belief that it's too late to start or it's too late to change my pain or to change my body or my mobility um, and, and chronic pain, for example? Well, there's a loaded, that's a loaded question. Um, no. <laughs> um, it, it, well, I mean, there's so much to unpack there, but I, you know, I think that, I think that there's, you know, as we start talking about life purpose, there's, I think sometimes there's two things that we have to weigh. There's our motivation to live our life purpose. Mm -hmm. And, and so there, that also needs to be in check. Like how badly do mm -hmm. I want to change? How badly do I want to feel better? And, and unfortunately, a lot of us are conditioned to like, oh, in order to feel better, there's a pill for that. 
right. <laughs> and people, like I say, like, just, I feel like eight minutes is a good negotiation. You know, <laughs> I feel like eight minutes is, is, is like the bare minimum of a negotiation for people to, um, to make. But it, sometimes it's like, you know, asking people to hand over their firstborn child. Um, it's just like, oh my God, I just don't have time, but you had time to go do X, Y, and Z. So there has to be a motivation to feel better. And um, I think that kind of comes part and parcel with, it's never too late. Um, mm -hmm. I never forget, I had this one woman come um, uh, in my teacher trainings, teacher training immersions, we've been attracting more and more and more older people. Um, I have a woman in my training right now, she must be like 62, 63 years old. And she's been like hanging on every word and, and, and also practicing it. And it's funny, because when she came into the training, she literally was like this. And her whole torso was like, literally 10 degrees forward. Um, it's quite amazing. And she within like it's like day six I turned to her and I said you're standing tall you're not walking around you know with this hunched over like you know older person look yeah. <laughs> you know like how sometimes older people kind of like shuffle because they're afraid they're gonna fall over yeah. and and there's just it's just too painful to stand up but she was standing up like really well and it's stability, right? It's stability. Um, right. Her issue is is really in her trunk extensors right. and they're not shortening properly. Um, and you know, it, it, we did a before and after photo just of her standing up and just coming like to neutral, like just standing without really thinking about it. Not like, you know, the yoga way, but <laughs> but just standing in neutral. And it was even shocking for me. Like I knew there would be a difference, but I didn't expect it to be that dramatic. Mm. And, and so I think like, it's never too late. We, we can't, we can always to some degree start bringing a better kind of muscle function to our body, no matter how old we are, no yeah. matter what's going on in our life, we can always create better muscle function. It just really depends on the desire within us. Do we desire to feel better? Do we desire to, to still live in purpose or we, have we given up? Um, mm -hmm. And so my goal is to get people like at least feeling a little bit better. So as they feel better, that light of knowledge, that light of awareness, because, oh yeah, life can be different. And that awareness kind of starts to seep in and hopefully that starts to motivate people even more so. Wow, beautiful. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Sherry. Before we sign off, it's just coming up to one hour. Does anybody have any other questions? Well, I see a few people that kind of I know um, uh, that kind of tuned in today. It was really wonderful to see you guys here. Um, we will be sending this out on the replay and uh, so you guys can get access to it. It's just a real delight to um, see you guys here. Uh, next month's topic, by the way, we're going to be getting into the history of yoga a little bit. That's the next podcast coming up. I am so excited because I felt like by episode five, I started finding my groove with these publishing the, and producing these podcasts. So I think you guys are really going to enjoy it. Um, but I also think that you guys are really going to start to understand in this podcast in the next one coming up why are we stretching so much? Where did the stretching paradigm come from? And why has it infected? Yes, I use that word infected, infected the yoga world so much. So that's what we're going to be kind of talking about. And um, again, it's just such a delight to be here. My goal for these is to provide a forum for you guys to ask questions. So please come if you have questions in the month, but any kind of yoga postures, any kind of yoga practices, bring them here. And um, this is this is your one-on-one -on -one with Yogi Aaron. <laughs> Thank you so much for your time. <laughs> Thank you, Sherry. <laughs> Thank you. I'll see you next month. Yes, you will. And uh, thank you guys so much. I see some other comments. Thank you, Yogi Aaron. Bye. How are you? It's Felicia. Hi, Felicia. Nice How to see you. How are you? 
Good. Oh my God. You. It's so good to see you. Um, I have you. to tell you a funny story because you're talking about posture. So uh -huh. really quickly, um, I was with a group of paddlers um, in, and I was walking with Michael and this lady goes like this. Oh, we want to be like Felicia because look at her posture. And then I went, what posture? She goes, oh, you stand like so erect. We, we need to like practice like you. And then all of a sudden you were on my shoulder. And I went, hmm, that's because I practice. I didn't, and I don't even notice how, how I stand now, but I stand with great posture. Thanks to you. <laughs> oh, thank you, Felicia. That makes me so happy. Uh, yes. Yeah. It made me feel good too. Cause I didn't really recognize that I was doing that, but it's just from doing yoga, I guess. Yes. Well, doing all of these kind of practices help you so much. So Felicia, it's so wonderful to hear your voice. Thank you. No, it's good to nice see you too. too. Nice to see you too, my friend. I know. You guys I can cry. <laughs> <laughs> I will see you soon one day. I hope Michael so. Michael says hello. Well, say hello to Michael and I hope to see you guys maybe next month or in these Q&As. Um, yes, yes, yes. I'll try to bring him along. He's working, but um, I will try to, to uh, chime in again. Oh, so have a wonderful month, everybody. Um, enjoy your summer. Get out and breathe and practice the yama. So okay. namaste, Take everybody. Take care. <laughs> Bye -bye. Thank you. Bye.